you. Um, so now you should be seeing a big field of uh, ramsons there, uh, wild food and foraging. So um, welcome. This is the last of my talks with this third series, these environmental talks, and I, I really enjoy presenting uh, the topics to you. And thank you all for your uh, interest and attendance at, at these events. Um, I will make the presentation available at the end. Um, I'll share a link uh, because there's lots of recipes. Hopefully, you'll, you'll drum up an appetite for many of you as well. Um, so yeah, don't worry if you don't have time to write everything down or it's, it's there just to give ideas of what you can do with some of the commoner plants that we find in the UK. Um, just to let you know what the talk will cover, um, the basic principles for collecting, an introduction to, introduction to active plant compounds. So um, a, lot of the, a lot of the foods that we eat are often good for us, but there's a reason behind the reason why we eat certain foods. So I'm gonna talk, the first part of the presentation will be about the, the various compounds, organic compounds that we find within plants, which we then have a therapeutic use for when we consume them. Um, and they have some beneficial effect for us. And then we're gonna look at various wildflowers and also uh, I've got 12 flowers that we're, we'll look at and I've got I think 16 different recipe ideas. And again, many of these are interchangeable. Um, so we'll have a, an initial start about foraging and just the essence of it and really to be a good forager and a, a, a considerate forager really. Most important thing, I can't stress this enough, is identification of flowers. I'll do my best to, to talk about the characteristics of the flowers that we'll look at through the, the, the presentation. But there are flowers that look similar. You may misidentify something, but a positive identification is absolutely essential in foraging. Um, there are some flowers that may not have beneficial effects on the body, which look very similar to, to uh, one that we're trying to forage for. So um, really, really important. Um, if you're in any doubt, just, just don't pick it. Take a photo, maybe um, share it on an app like iNaturalist, and you've got some brilliant specialists there who will help you identify it correctly. So that's a really good uh, source of information for you as well. Uh, um, this talk is about educating about wildflowers and, and some of the uses of them and how we can incorporate them into foods. And it's for your personal consumption only. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know how many of you are active um, in foraging for foods and are looking to develop your ideas or it's something brand new to you, um, but it's all about how, it's all about the personal uh, consumption uh, rather than commercial use. Um, another basic principle is to only gather plants which are common and these flowers that we're presenting this evening are all common um, and you should only harvest them when they are in abundance as well. Um, so that's, you know, a common sense really and it's like with etiquette and being a considerate forager, you know, only taking what you need. Um, and how you, with the techniques you use to gather the plant, so cutting them, maybe taking some small scissors with you and just taking what you want. Um, because every action that we have does have an impact on the ecology of an ecosystem. So, you know, even a small action may have profound impact unless we adhere to these kind of common principles. Um, Ensure the site is free from pollutants or fouling. So be thoughtful about where you harvest from. Um, so, you know, busy roadsides, developed areas, there's dog walkers, there's, uh, you know, uh, 
runoff from roads, there's all sorts of agricultural impacts that may have an, an effect on, you know, um, how pure that, that um, plant is. But so select carefully and wash thoroughly, I would say with that. And also uh, it's very important to get permission. So we are not, there's a, the Wildlife and Countryside Act from 1981 um, says and states that it's illegal to uproot and dig up a plant without the landowner's permission. Um, so, you know, your, where you harvest and, and gather foods from is really important to ensure you've got permission. Um, you know, it's, somebody owns that land basically. So, so make sure that you get permission for that. And as I said, we'll look at the plants from their kind of therapeutic point of view and um, what impacts they have on the body, these active compounds. So, um, you know, people have relied through history and the dawn of civilization really um, on plants um, medicinally. Um, it goes back to Chinese scriptures. It's recorded in the Egyptian hieroglyphs as well. So. The plants naturally produce compounds, um, such as the ones which I'm going to list here, and we'll run through these. So saponins, alkaloids, bitters, glycosides, phenols, flavonoids, tannins, essential oils. So we'll run through these, talk about them. Um, so it's educational. Um, I'm not a, a pharmacologist and I'm not a natural uh, herbalist. Um, so these is information I've gathered from sources which I'll share with you at the end. Um, so it's my aim is really to educate and, and to show you that there are various things that we we can utilize from wild flowers but again I'm not endorsing the whole um, use medicinally it's more nutritionally I, I guess it would be my would be my uh, angle you know in the way that these compounds complement each other and, and they have a similar energetic or synergy effect on the body um, you know it's just you know I think it's very interesting um, some of them have very strong profound impacts on the body and considered poisons so the wrong amount of something has a very can have a very detrimental effect as well um, so we're going to run through some of these groups of compounds so there's a group called the saponins, and there are 11 categories of saponins. And they essentially have a sugar with an aromatic molecule. And when they're dissolved in water, produce a soapy froth. So many plants produce a soapy froth, and it's because of um, the presence of a saponin. And there are 11 categories and of these, and most of them are toxic. Um, some have a bitter taste, but it's really important to know what you're uh, looking at to identify. So um, things like the, the plant that we see there is the ragged robin. Horse chestnut seeds are poisonous to us and they contain um, saponins. The roots of bracken, marsh marigolds, and for instance. Um, and there's a group of plants called the soap wort, which contain up to 8% or so saponins in their roots. So very, very high concentration. And they've been used as detergents back way back to the early kind of Arab, um, Arab physicians who used them to treat skin conditions a long time ago. Um, ginseng root, uh, licorice, they're examples of saponin containing plants. But so is spinach. So we know that certain amount of certain types of saponins are OK, but there's others which are toxic and should never be taken internally. Um, so you know, it's a little bit of information is a useful thing. Another big group of, of, of um, active plant compounds are alkaloids. And these, what they have in common is they all contain um, nitrogen. And so the word alkaloid comes from the word alkaline, which is like a nitrogenous um, base. Um, and they have a very strong and varied effect on the body. There are seven groups and most of them are poisonous to humans, but are used medicinally and uh, producing pharmacological drugs such as atropine, which is found in deadly nightshade, and quinine. So things that end in INE 
Um, there's a lot of um, alkaloids which end in I and E. Um, things like strychnine, which is a pesticide. You've got codeine, morphine, cocaine, nicotine, and then the one in the image there is caffeine. So caffeine, strong diuretic, a stimulant and quite bitter to taste. One of the uh, ones which we can ingest, but as I said, the other ones are they're, they're very strong, profound impacts on the body. So they're considered poison. So again, a lot of consideration needed when we use. So the 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 uh, the caffeine, for example, is a certain type of alkaloid um, known as a purine. And then there's a big group called the bitters, and they have a bitter effect. Um, and the image that we have there is the great yellow gentian, which is a very long history of use as a bitter um, compound from the roots of that, that plant. It's an ancient um, kind of uh, medicinal plant. Um, they have a really profound impact on our digestive system. So they stimulate gastric glands, promote saliva and bile production. Um, they often used to uh, flavor liqueurs to stimulate our digestion, uh, can improve appetite and so on. Um, so that's often why you have a digestive um, schnapps or a Jägermeister, those sort of um, strong alcoholic drinks are really good to, to stimulate the digestion. Then there's another very big group of active plant compounds called glycosides. And these basically have a sugar, which is bonded to something which isn't a sugar through a certain type of bond, a chemical bond that holds them together. And uh, the names are often uh, given to the thing that attaches to the sugar. So the non-sugar thing attaching to a sugar. Um, and examples are alcoholic glycosides. You may have heard of a cardiac glycoside or a phenolic glycoside, a flavonoid glycoside. Um, an example of alcoholic glycoside is salicin, which you find in the bark of willow trees. Um, and a cardiac glycoside, which has a very strong effect on the heart, um, is digitoxin, which is found in the plant that we see here, which is the foxglove. Um, and it's had a, a first use, it's a very long history of use, from the 1775. So it's been known to have that profound impact on the heart or effect on the heart for a very long period of time. So in the right hands with the right uh, medical practitioners, these things are used in medicine, but there if, if we were, you know, we, we all know of foxglove as being a poisonous plant, but it has got uses in certain doses used by um, the proper regulated authorities. So um, Another group that we, we, we talk uh, or we know are the, the things called the phenols, which is a type of glycoside, but they're aromatic. And they're found in all foods, but in different concentrations. So salicylic acid is an example of a phenol. And I mentioned salicin just before as a glycoside, but salicylic acid, which uh, is derived, I believe, metabolically from that. Um, is used to create the pharmaceutical drug aspirin. So, you know, we've got um, a kind of definite link between uh, a phenol and a, a medicinal uh, drug that we're aware of. Their effects, analgesic, obviously, um, but also their phenols have an antiseptic and anti-inflammatory impact on the body. And the image there we have, um, time in that photo, lovely, bright, sunny day. Um, and that contains uh, something called thymol, which is a natural phenol. Um, flavonoids, uh, these produce the yellow color in petals and a flavonoids essentially are great antioxidants. So they're really good for the body and they occur, um, it's something like 4,000 different types of flavonoids. Um, and they've been used in the textile industry for, for dyes as well as, as um, for, for food. So onions, garlic, basil, spinach, green leafy veg have all uh, got lots of flavonoids. So they have a very beneficial effect, an antioxidant effect. Um, 
they help circulation and are anti-inflammatory as well. So they have those medicinal actions to the body, but also very um, tasty as well. We'll talk about two more active plant compounds before we go into the different species that we'll, we'll talk about. Um, the tannins, um, it's, they're very, very common in many, many plants. They have an effect of preventing animal grazing the leaves. So they're, they're preventative from, you know, these plants preventing uh, grazing. But they're what make your tongue go fuzzy and dry when you're drinking wine. So it's that, that tartness or that effect which dries the mouth, that astringent effect. Um, that's caused by a, the tannin. Um, the flower that we see in this image here is a member of the rose family, but unusually it's just got four petals as opposed to a lot of the other rose family species which have five petals. Um, and this one is common in the mountains and moorlands of the UK, um, and it's known as Tormentil. And you hear the name Torment Ill, so it's got a medicinal name uh, associated with it, and it's to do with the stomach. Uh, it's been used traditionally as a mouthwash and also to help against ulcers as well. I don't know if they're mouth or stomach ulcers, but it, it certainly got that astringent effect has a, has a positive um, effect on the body. And it's also tannins were used in the tanning industry. So from oak bark, um, it was used as the effect to denature animal protein. So it helped to soften um, leather in the leather tanning industry. And then the last uh, active plant compound, which we'll look at are the volatile oils. And these are extracted from plants to produce essential oils and are some of the most important active plant compounds. Um, they've got strong aroma. Um, they have great medicinal benefits. Um, they're strongly antiseptic, anti-inflammatory, and a lot of them have a, a positive uh, stimulating effect on the nervous system and in aromatherapy uh, these essential oils are used to change moods and to detoxify the body and so on um, so you see there uh, an image of a mint so the aromatic family of, of plants are the mint family also ginger contains lots and um, things like tea tree as well different family groups but these volatile oils can be found in many different plant types and then other plant compounds, which we won't cover now, are just things like minerals, vitamins, mucilage, um, cyanogenic glycosides and anthocyanins. So uh, there's, there's many, and we've just had a very broad overview to give us an idea. When we look at the different plants, the effects that that plant might have on us is to do with the combination of the um, compounds that the plants um, possess. When we do harvest um, our wild foods and we go foraging, um, it's, it's, there's many, many ways to preserve. A couple of just big pointers really, ensure you pick, if you're picking leaves, pick them young, pick them fresh and clean if you, if you can. Gather on dry sunny days. Um, it's much, much more beneficial to, to, to do that. Get rid of anything that's mouldy or is going to spoil over time when you especially when you're preserving don't dry in direct sunlight but dry maybe on drying racks or dehydrators and so on there's a variety of ways of doing that and we'll talk about some of these techniques um, sterilize jars and bottles before you, you use them um, make sure they're airtight as well and label and date them so these from what I've been reading, you know, various date lives and shelf lives for these things. So date them and then you'll know exactly what's, you know, when you harvested it, when you made it and what it is in that jar as well. And then there's a whole variety of techniques. I want to give examples this evening, um, but there's a whole myriad of ways that you could, you might have your own ideas about, oh, you fancy making that or make it something different, but using the ideas from tonight, to do, to have your own creative ideas um, there. So as I said, we're looking at common plants and a lot of these common plants 
around the UK are often overlooked um, for their beneficial effects or their nutritional uh, value as a wild food. Um, identification is key. Um, some of you will know, for instance, this plant by looking at that image there, but there are characteristics that we'll look at which, which will help us to identify. So um, there's a pointy tip there. There's um, here, there's a ring of leaves around a stem which is square. So a square stem and a ring of leaves. And if you've got a big screen you're looking at this on, I'll change the next image, but um, cleavers, and I think the image comes up here, a close up, you can see the hairs, the sticky hairs on the, uh, on, on the leaves there. They're, and hence it's got its name, um, sticky willy. Oh, goosegrass, because it's the plant that you pick up and you throw on someone's back as a child and it would stick to them because of these hairs. So um, if you knew what that was, that's great. If you didn't, let's look at some of the identification. It's in the bedsore family. So the bedsore family have this, um, often a square stem and also this ring of leaves. And sometimes the leaves are in a certain number, um, but it's this ring or this wall of leaves which is a key indicator for that family. Um, it goes to about a metre tall, possibly in, in shade and where it's able to be supported, but it's herbaceous, it's a non-woody plant. Um, harvest early. So you get these sticky balls, these seeds that appear after the flowers have, have gone to seed. And by that time, the plant is really past its, its best. So again, pick young fresh leaves if you can from the tips, although the whole of that plant is, uh, can be used, um, it's always best to get it young. So we talked about the medicinal effects or the actions on the body. So if you were to, to do something uh, in terms of food with this, it has an anti-inflammatory effect, it's a diuretic, but importantly, it, it's quite strong and strengthening for the lymphatic system. There's not many plants that I know of which have a positive effect on the lymphatic system. So it's used as well for chronic skin conditions, lymph nodes and cystitis. And this is information that I've gathered from sources which I'll share with you later. So um, I've blended these up. So you don't get a lot of juice if you, if you were to blend the cleavers, um, you might, you might get a very concentrated little green thimble full of fluid from um, quite a large amount of them. Um, but then you could dilute that into say apple juice and then you could have that as your, your lymphatic tonic. Um, or you could make a cold infusion, um, grab some big handfuls of, of fresh um, stems and, and leaves, quarter of a cucumber, some lemon slices, half liter of water, and what to do, wash, finely chop, crush the cleavers. So you crush them and you help to, um, for that, for all the goodness to infuse out into that, into that water. Keep up the, the cucumber, slice and dice, add the lemons, cover, and just keep in a fridge. So the longer you leave it to steep, um, the, the more impact it will have. So it's a nice fresh drink to have the next day. Shelf life is a couple of days because it's fresh and it's not being preserved. Here's um, another plant. I don't know how many of you will know what that is, but look at the characteristics of that. There's a big spreading mass of that in that, in that image. Um, there's actually, for those keen eyed, you'll see some of the cleavers uh, just over here in the picture as well. So it gives you an idea of the size of the sticky willies, the cleavers, which you just talked about. And then this plant, which has got these great big heart shaped leaves with these toothed edges. You've got these flowers, which are white, these cluster of flowers, which have four petals. So some of you will know as garlic mustard or Jack by the hedge. Um, if you have a close up look at the flower, you can see those four white petals. So it's characteristic of a certain family and the seed pod that you can see in the image here as well, that's characteristic of 
some of you may know, the cabbage family, the brassicas. It's a really important, economically important group uh, of, with mustards, bitter cresses and so on, uh, rape and for the rapeseed. And so it's a, a, you know, a, a really important family. Characteristic is the four petals. So again, if you were picking this before the leaves or before the petals come out, um, you might not be sure what it is it, that the leaf itself could be mistaken for a, a singing nettle, for instance, or it could be something else. But the flower is often the thing that helps us to identify everything. It's a biennial herb. So biennial means it lives for two years and then it dies. So the first year produces a leaf that looks nothing like the leaf in the photo. The second year, it produces the tall plant with the flowers and then it goes to seed and then it dies. So it's the second year of that um, growth that we eat and consume the, the, the leaves of this plant. So I would collect it again from now until May. The older leaves and the longer it's left into through the season, the, the older and tougher the leaves get and they're less digestible or they're less they're, 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 they're tougher and they're probably stronger in flavor as well so young fresh like you'd pick a salad leaf you could take these and use them as salad leaves um, eat the flowers as well and the seed pods the actions on the body again a, a tonic so it's strengthening um, for the organs it's diuretic anti-asthmatic and antiseptic so uh, if it's anti-asthmatic, it's probably got some of these volatile oils, um, maybe phenols in there as well. It's used for respiratory uh, conditions like asthma, bronchitis, skin conditions like eczema. Externally, it's used to treat itches and bites and stings. So you could just crush a few leaves and rub it on um, your onto the affected area. Um, here's a great idea. I love making pesto, but um, wild pesto, we often use uh, wild garlic, but why not substitute um, the garlic mustard? Um, if it's in your area and it's, it's available, it's really quick and simple. I make quite a lot of this. I eat a lot of pesto, I love it. Um, and I make it with all different sorts of nuts. So you can use almonds, uh, pine nuts, hazelnuts, whatever kind of nuts to give it that kind of texture. Um, Parmesan cheese, uh, and then big uh, 150 ml of olive oil, exact, exactly how you want it more runny or, or thicker. It's entirely up to you and the proportions of these. But place ingredients into a blender, whiz until it's a smooth, fine paste. Add it to pasta, which is classic, but I also love it with, um, you could have it on new potatoes or in a mashed potato, you could stir it in and mix it up in that way. Uh, maybe have cheese on top and put it in the oven. So I don't know. Um, or have it as a dip. So there's many, many versatile ways of, of using this. And that's what really I'm trying to put across in the, in the talk. It's not just to be prescriptive, but to just uh, illustrate that there's so many things that we can do with a simple uh, wild food that we can just in, in, you know, introduce into our kind of uh, culinary kind of uh, explorations. And again, with the oil covered, uh, sort of for 10 days, just like you would a jar that you'd buy in the shop um, and keep it in the fridge, keep it cool. So there's, uh, I think we'll all recognize that flower. It's been out, it's one of the first flowers that you see in the spring. Um, it just epitomizes the spring. It's not quite as common as it, as it once was. Um, their numbers are in serious decline not sure why it's not through harvesting and picking but it's possibly habitat um, change or something to do with the uh, runoff from farms or i'm not sure um why but they're in they are in quite serious decline around the country and it is the primrose uh the the species name vulgaris is something vulgar it's common so it's the the common uh primrose and prim means the first, so the prime rose. It's the first rose that we see in the springtime. 
wrinkly leaves, hair, slightly hairy on the underside, forms a, a, a ring of leaves at the base of the plant. As you can see, the flowers are generally pale to deep yellow, sometimes uh, kind of purplish. Um, natural forms, you get purplish. I think you get more of those in Wales for some reason. Um, and then you have this darker yellowy orange center. Petals are notched, as you can see. So you've got five petals with deep notches in the, in the tips, 10 centimeters tall. Um, again, early, spring really February when they're out until May um, pick them young if you can you can eat the flowers and the young leaves it has an effect of anti-inflammatory astringent so it's binding and it uh, draws the water so it's um, a bit like the, the tannins and it also has a sedative effect so there may be an alkaloid in there um, and some alkaloids have a sedative effect um, like valerian tea, uh, you might have had valerian tea when you go to sleep because it has a it has that effect on on us rather than the stimulating effect. So it may well be to do with um, the, those active compounds. So use them for spasms, cramps, paralysis, rheumatic pains. There's so many things to do with uh, so versatile with these, but I think if you've never um, sugared and dried uh, flowers, then this is a, a fantastic example of, of one. And this is a, a kind of recipe idea that um, I made with uh, like a, a sweet pizza um, for an event I did a couple of years ago. Um, so in here, we've got a balsamic drizzle, we've got um, pear, and then this leaf, for those of you um, who may be aware, three leaves that often fold in, well, they always fold in at night, but they open in the day when it's dry. Um, wood sorrel, that's got a little kind of lemony, apple taste. So with sugared primroses, we've got sweet balsamic drizzle and you've got a sweet pizza as an idea for a recipe. But um, if we're, you know, picking these, these flowers, which are, again, it's just useful to pick them when it's dry. I think it, dry and sunny days, the question's popped up. It just gets the best out of the um, enhanced uh, uh, active compounds, I, I think are probably better on a hot, dry day than when it's a wet day, when there may be um, you know, more fungi and spores and things like that. So I, I, I think there's a couple of reasons why you pick them when it's uh, a warm and dry day rather than wet and, and cold when they're closed up. Um, so get egg white, um, lightly beaten, Use tweezers if you like, dip, dip them in, and then dip them in, uh, again, dry caster sugar. Use a paintbrush to tease it into the crinkles and the hollows. Leave it to air dry for one to two days in a nice warm, dry area of the house, um, and then store in an airtight container. And it can they if they're preserved well, made well, they can last for a year. So they've got a really good long shelf life. If you can wait that long. <laughs> Um, but there's a, a fantastic bank in a, a damp woodland of a very, very, you smell that plant so, you know, so much sooner than you actually see the plant. And you can see the leaves here are starting to turn yellow. So some of these leaves are going old already in this image. So again, you would pick the younger, fresher leaves and not the older ones. And it is Ramsen's uh, wild garlic. Member of the, they were formerly of the lily family, but the lilies, it's an amaryllis family now, but they have six petals. And that's quite distinctive of those, those groups. I think the, 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 the family has been split up. So these, um, but it's a good characteristic of, of knowing what you've got. Um, so yeah, amaryllis family, Damp woodlands, the leaves are dark green, glossy, paper thin. The white flowers are six petals and growing round clusters. But when the, the flowers come out, the, the, the leaves start to go that yellow. So really, you can eat the flowers as well as the leaves. Um, but you want to catch them early in the year. So March, April, come May, they're starting to, to you know, all the goodness is going out of those leaves. Um, but there are flowers still around. Uh, in, into May. So uh, 
actions. They have um, antiviral, uh, antimicrobial, antifungal, antioxidant effects on the body. So very broad range of probably, a, a, you know, the synergistic uh, combination of all the compounds in its uh, combined form, you know, in its raw form, rather than extracting a certain compound. So in that, um, you have these great benefits of these combinations of the active compounds within a plant. Um, so yeah, taken holistically, just as a plant like that, rather than extracting a certain compound. So these things often work synergistically on the body. Used for colds, flu, so that's respiratory again, gastric infections and high blood pressure. So what can we do with it? Well, garlic pest, you know, pesto is, is a simple idea, but why not um, make some um, kind of spiced uh, um, Korean, South Korean kind of food, kimchi, which is fermented cabbage. So grab some ramson leaves, carrot, onion, quarter of a cabbage, a lot of salt, because you're going to make a brine, um, and then uh, water, and then you're going to make a spicy paste. And again, you could use ramsons in this, but ginger, chilies, or garlic. Crush that together. So make the paste, chop the other ingredients, stir in the salt, and then place a weighted bowl over the ingredients and leave for an hour. Then you pour in the water. You reinsert that weighted bowl, make sure everything's submerged. And so extract all the air, basically. Rest it overnight, strain it and then stir in the spice, the heat, um, and then spoon into jars and push down, remove all the air. It's really important to get all the air out because it will ferment. Um, and as it does ferment, you need to let the gases out. So leave it for five days to ferment, releasing the gases, and you can consume, it's really tasty. Um, and you can adapt the, the recipe to suit your, your own taste as well. Baba ganoush, I love baba ganoush with aubergine, um, but instead of putting garlic, why not experiment putting ramsons in there as well? So um, maybe you have tahini or um, peanut butter, any other almond butter, there's all sorts of things you can replace tahini with. Um, and then lemon is really, is really clear, uh, key and olive oil. So roast the aubergine 40 minutes until it's lovely and soft, um, blend it, and then add the other ingredients, blend that and, and just have that with bread or as a dip or whatever. So three days if it lasts that long. Um, here's one plant in the carrot family. So it's got characteristics of the carrot family. It's the only one in the carrot family that I've got. I've not included anything from the buttercup family. And this one is uh, uh, in the carrot family. There's a lot of um, strong active compounds in the carrot family. So you, you know, in terms of identification, you might want to avoid that. But this has got a very distinctive um, feature in the root, which some of you will um, know by the, the, the photo, but that's the leaf, that very divided leaf. And it is the pig nut. So there's a nut and it was truffled out by the by pigs in the olden days and, and boars. So um, it's got a scent that, that they that they like, that they go down. Um, that's an example. Um, it's often much deeper in the ground on a very thin, delicate root. So it's very hard to prise them out of the ground. Um, a member of the carrot family, as I said, identification, please be incredibly careful. But that nut itself is the key thing. Um, you can eat it raw, you can have it boiled as well. Um, you get those delicate umbels of white flowers. The leaves don't come out until April time, so it's hard to see it. Then the, the flower itself might be the key to help you identify it. Um, but they're perennials, so that that nut will be growing and growing and growing. But because you're uprooting it, remember there's the law about um, you need permission to uproot. It's illegal to, to uproot something without the owner's permission. So you eat this root tuber. It's said to promote lust. So there's one, I'm not sure um, who's tried that, but um, there's a, a known use historically for that. I've stolen that image from the internet, um, but I, I saw this idea of sauteed beans and ginger with, with um, uh, an, a, a nut. And I thought, oh, we could substitute pig nut for that. So I gave, gave it a recipe. So um, 
green beans, garlic, ginger, cooked peanut, uh, pig nuts, um, sesame oil. So it's got that kind of oriental kind of flavor to it. Three minutes of cooking for the beans and the pig nut. Again, you can have them raw or, or you could cook them for three minutes. Um, and then just uh, blanch it, you know, blanch those and then, and then um, mix all the ingredients. Three minutes and then you've got a very quick, healthy, um, nutritious dinner meal. I mean, you could take the garlic and get ramsons or put Jack by the Hedge in there as well. So you can start to mix all different things into the, uh, um, into the dish itself. So this plant, very common and it's got an amazing array of, of um, active compounds in it. It's an, it's an ancient medicinal plant. Um, you've got this feathery leaf. You can see the way it's growing there, very aromatic as well. It's yarrow, Achillea millifolia, so a thousand leaves. So it's got that feathery leaf. Member of the daisy family. So you have these outer petals, these ray florets, and then you have this central disc, disc florets for those of you who understand those, those kind of um, terms, which you find in, in the flower books. Common grassland plant. Um, it's just got so many, it's got so many names as well. So the more names a plant has, often the more um, uses it's got. So it's been called nosebleed. It's been called it was milfoil, um, staunch wort. Um, and so staunch wort, so it staunches bleeding. So it has an effect to stop bleeding. Um, so, it, you know, all these different names um, allude to it, its effectiveness. So, it, and you find it very common right throughout the growing season from through to the autumn, have the flowers and the leaves. So it's astringent, so it's binding, it's styptic, which is to do with stopping bleeding. Anti-inflammatory, it's bitter, and it's a tonic for the circulatory system. So there's many uses for it there. So um, making a, a, an infusion of it, um, I've got it, hanging up there uh, as an image. So uh, a lot of the, the, these beneficial uh, compounds will, will, will go with gravity into the, the head. So as you, you dry them out, and that was just in my greenhouse, uh, you could put a paper bag over them to stop all the bits falling on the ground and use that, keep that. Um, you can have it fresh or you could dry it. So you can keep it for at least a year if it's dried properly. Um, add a spoonful of honey, boiling water, um, boil for in let it infuse for five to ten minutes. Add the honey. You could add chamomile, peppermint. There's all sorts. Again, these are just ideas. Um, so you can store it for a year if it's right. If you open it, it doesn't smell very good. I wouldn't use it, but you know it might not have kept as well as you might have hoped. So again, just be very cautious on that. Um, yeah. So as I put there, you know, once dry. Uh, crumble it into dark jars to preserve it, hang upside down um, to get those volatile oils to the tip. Very common plant all over the country. Um, in the morning, it opens and it becomes the day. Its, its name comes from the day's eye and it tracks the sun, the daisy. Um, in the daisy family, obviously, uh, very, very common. Um, and again, it's got great uses um it's you can harvest this throughout the year um it was even in flower in february at home this year use the flowers it's anti-inflammatory it's styptic so it helps bleeding um you use it for bumps and bruises a bit like arnica again which is in the daisy family a much rarer plant so it's harvested and for its medicinal uses in ointments but why not use de the daisy to do exactly the same effect and make a balm to help bruises so externally so grab some fresh daisies dried olive oil to cover um, or any oil of your choosing and beeswax and basically place the the flower heads in a jar cover with the oil and leave to infuse for a couple of weeks to draw out all that goodness um, then 120 ml of the oil and 20 grams of beeswax Make a bamry with hot water, boiling water on the stove, let it all dissolve together, and then pour it into jars, seal it, or as I've done there, just left it open, and then you can apply that topically and it will store for up to a year. 
external use only. Very common plant again, the dandelion, uh, taraxacum. So its name tarax comes from um, Greek and it means disorder and acum comes from uh, the Greek for remedy. So it's, it's got a medicinal use written in, it, in, in its uh, scientific name there. Again, remember daisy family, bright yellow flowers. Um, you can see these big teeth, the Dont de Leon, the, the lion's teeth uh, on the leaves there. So it's characteristic of that plant. You get a, a milky latex sap from the stem, which you make rubber bands out of if you harvest enough. Um, lots of closely related species. Uh, use of flowers when they're closed, not when they're fully open. They're really bitter when they're really open. Roots are great in the winter for make, drying and making dandelion, um, dandelion coffee, quite tasty. Um, and the young, fresh leaves as well. So it's bitter, it's a laxative, diuretic, stimulates the kidney. So again, appetite, water retention, rheumatism, it's got many uses. Um, Oriental fried dandelion leaves. So get some young leaves. If you have old leaves, boil them um, for five minutes to get that, um, you know, uh, you might want to boil them and just get rid of that, that harsh bitterness. Um, and then, uh, yeah, um, fry the leaves, sesame oil until they're softened and then add sesame seeds afterwards. So you can use it to replace spinach. So yeah, perfect perfect way of, of, of uh, eating dandelions. I probably don't need to tell you what that plant is that close up. Um, if you were that close up, you might even get stung by it. Um, very, very common. It's an absolute um, fantastic superfood. It's brilliant. Um, you can see that image there. You can see these very, very sharp silica um, sharp um, needles that you get and in there there's histamine and there's formic acid which is where you get the sting from they cover the leaves they cover the whole plant um, very very painful um, but if you handle the nettle well uh, I was there with a group of students teaching how to um, use it to, to make things like uh, bracelets and things that you can see in that image there so if they handle well you can crush those needles and it destroys uh, it destroys the needle and it, it uh, you know you can then you can handle the needle uh, the the nettle there um, the entire plant is covered in these hairs you, you yeah just be very cautious with it but it's so nutritious it contains iron formic acid ammonia histamine so many vitamins um, protein it is really a superfood it's brilliant uh, I think we should all be taking cup of tea with some leaves and nettles every day really it's it's so good as a plant and again collect the young leaves you can collect them later in the season as long as they're young and fresh from the tips of the plant not the large older um, uh, leaves so get them fresh it's nutritive it's a tonic it's astringent um, it's good for anemia stress allergies arthritis rheumatism a couple of recipes with this one, uh, nettle puree. This is delicious. Um, so nettle tips, um, butter, flour, milk. And again, if you're allergic, then you can substitute and make, make your own versions of these. Um, season with nutmeg and salt and pepper. Um, blanched nettles in salted water for two minutes, drain, make your simple bechamel sauce, blend together into a puree season and again very short shelf life i put that there on a, on a crumpet because i love crumpets i love eggs so it's just a really nice recipe idea there for you um and also you can make a tonic so it's really good for the circulatory system um it's iron rich so this tonic is for uh helping iron so you can take a shot of this um every day or every few days um you can again there are a variety of recipes um, with this. So nettle tips, apricots on sulfur, the zest for an orange, red wine, you can put brandy in there as well. Um, cover the ingredients with the wine, leave it for a couple of weeks, strain, um, 
and then you just store that and keep it, you know, unless it goes vinegary. Red clover, um, very uh, common and very easy to, uh, to identify, especially with this white V mark on the leaves there. Member of the pea family. Um, three leaves, four if you're lucky, the four leaf clover. Um, yeah, as I said, uh, May, September, so they flower throughout the year. Um, you can use the aerial parts as a diuretic and a tonic effect, uh, used for skin conditions, acne. So again, I don't know if that's taken topically or um, how, but these are the uh, uses. So I made a, a red clover lemonade. So grab the blossoms, water, honey or sugar. Uh, and again, lemons really add some great flavor um, and bring out the flavor as well. So simmer and cover for 10 minutes, add the honey to, until it's all dissolved or sugar, leave it to steep overnight, strain, and then make a fizzy drink out of that um, concentrate. So again, just a very interesting, easy way of using a wildflower um, to give a, you know, just kind of an alternate um, food to go, you know, um, go into the supermarket. This photo was probably taken in May. There's a whole host of, of plants in there. Um, and there's honeysuckle I can see in the, in the background. So that will be coming later in the, in the, the spring, early summer. But why not make a wildflower scented honey? So you can take dandelions, daisies, red clover blossoms, again, water and lemon, sugar, remove all the stalks, cover with boiling water and leave to steep overnight. So that draws all the goodness out of the, out of the leaves and the flowers, sorry. Strain through a sieve, add the lemon juice, and then with 600 ml of that liquid, you add 450 grams of sugar. So you measure out the right proportions, add it to a saucepan, heat until the sugar's dissolved. Rolling boil reduces the volume, makes more of a syrup. Um, and again, it's called honey, but it's essentially a syrup. And then pour into sterilized jars and, and you can store, if they're preserved well, for up to a year. This is a beautiful scented flower um, that you'll, you'll see and smell in damp places, hedgerows, um, you know, roadsides and, and so on. Um, meadow sweet, it's got several names. Um, Spirea is an old name for it, um, which is where the word aspirin comes from. So they extracted aspirin or salicylic acid from this plant before they found it or extracted it from willow um, bark. It's also called meadwort. It was used to flavor beer and wine, and it has a very natural sweetness, beautiful sweetness. So, um, and again, if we take the, um, you know, it's, it's later in the spring that we'll have that June and August, um, use the flowers, the upper leaves, anti-rheumatic, it's a painkiller, anti-inflammatory, um, digestive, disorder so uh, muscular pains and, and again that's maybe the salicylic acid um, and as I said the spirea comes is a root word for aspirin so again I've dried that there um, so again that could be interchanged with another um, plant like the arrow we looked at to make a tea infuse the leaves uh, five minutes um, you know and again store for up to a year if um, they're kept well Elder, there's a couple of plants that we, we still have to go through. So it's, we've got five minutes, so a couple of flowers to go through now. Elder, it's a bush. And again, this won't be in flower till uh, much later in the spring, early summer, really. Uh, Sambucus nigra is its name. Up to eight meters tall, it's found near towns and, and near dwellings around, you know, even in, in the countryside, you might come across it and it will be very close to where there is an old dwelling of some kind. Um, beautiful, sweet, quite a heady scent to it. Um, in, the spring, in the summer, you'll take the flowers and in the autumn, the berries. Antiviral, anti-allergy um, and the viburnic acid in the berries uh, is a 
diphoretic, which is uh, help, makes you sweat. But the flowers are used for hay fever and sinusitis, and the berries um, have got sambucol, which is a compound which is effective against flus, I believe, as well. So you can buy, uh, I think in health shops, you can go and buy um, flu remedies um, or, or tablets and lozenges with sambucol in. Elderflower vinegar, again, vinegar is a great way of preserving. Um, take the heads of flowers, you want them nice and dry, half a lime or a lemon and cider vinegar. Uh, separate the flowers from the stem, so just get the, the, the flowers themselves, the zest of the lime, vinegar and seal, shake it um, for two weeks, let it infuse, and then you can separate it out and just have the, uh, the, 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 the vinegar without the flowers in after that. So you can have it as a, as a drink as well. So there's all sorts of uses for that. And the last one we will look at, which is one which we won't be seeing until much later in the, in the spring, honeysuckle or woodbine, because of its, its uh, nature of creeping and climbing up um, other plants, hedgerows and through forests, floors and things like that. So beautiful scent. Um, the scent is stronger in the evening as it's a uh, moth pollinated, um, but you could suck the, the sweetness out of the, each of those flowers as well. So um, lots of natural sugars in there. Oh, I've not put when to collect, but it's gonna be um, from kind of end of May, June, July time, really. The flowers and the young leaves, antiseptic, anti-asthmatic, pain-killing compounds. So, Again, if they've got those, we know that they're analgesic, they may have um, phenols or glycosides in there and, and so on. So used for coughs and gum disease, uh, infections of the urinary uh, tract. Make a jelly, really tasty, beautiful. It's nice thick. Um, you can spread it onto you know, bread and all sorts of things. So it's uh, just another idea of a, a preserving technique, really. Um, steep the honeysuckle blossoms in boiling water allow it to cool, strain, combine with the other ingredients in the saucepan, dissolve and just let it thicken over five, maybe 10 minutes. Um, and then get it to the consistency that you'd like and then bottle it. So as I said, the materials I've used, fantastic book, uh, Roger Phillips Wild Food, The Forager's Kitchen. Again, these are brilliant resources. I'll share these with you afterwards so this is where all the the actions and the the uh the medicinal aspects of the herbal med the herbal um food comes from or the impacts they've got um hedger handbook is great for ideas and identification and then there's um a medicinal plants guide um so yeah those are the sources and a few others probably from the internet um that i've got recipe ideas from but you know it's they're, they're accessible, very visual, good for identification purposes. And um, this is the end of this uh, webinar series, this online talk series, and things are starting to open out um, and hopefully we'll be back to running courses in the outdoors, uh, workshops and so on. So uh, if you're interested, um, the workshops I run are CPD for um, outdoor professionals who members of mountain training and associated organizations um, so we look at aspects of the mountain environment uh, glaciation flowers come mountain flowers later in the um, end of may beginning of june and then i'm doing a talk with uh, sophie lee who was the presenter last week looking at upland birds now again be in north wales so follow the link to the website there for those and um, social media, I, I use those social media platforms at the bottom. Um, and then just in case you hadn't seen, I've produced a few products. So they're just ways of making learning fun, we play cards, there's all sorts of games we can play, um, but also learning about wildflowers, trees. So clear identification features and lots of facts that we can learn about um, you know the, the the nature that's all around us so there's top trumps as well as playing cards
and a book on the Alps, which I, I wrote with a, a, a colleague, Paul Gannon, who wrote about the geology and I wrote about the flowers of the Alps. So um, that's it from me. Uh, I hope you really enjoyed that. I'll have a look at the, the chat uh, function. If there's anything, then I'll, I'll, I'll email you um, any, I'll email you the link to the presentation and any questions that need answering as well. But I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, yeah, happy foraging. Okay, enjoy. Thank you again. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>